I was trying to, to, to pick myself back up again. And, and um, I mean, it started in 2008, and the, the legal case had lasted until 2013. And I had picked myself up a little bit and started mm -hmm. to make some money. And I was actually trying to purchase his company at the same time to get myself back on the feet. And, um, um, and then my attorney came to me one day and says, look, um, they're going to add, because we're, we're beating the charges. They had given me 25 charges. Each one's like four years, and we were beating all of them. He says, we're winning all of them. He says, but they're going to come up with another 25 charges. That's what's going to happen. Uh, welcome to L.A., Uriah. Glad to be in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you're a CEO of uh, Gentox. Gentox Medical Services and Seas Corporation, two companies. Um, how long have you been in business? Um, Seas Corporation uh, started back in 1929. Wow. Uh, so it's quite old. I'm the third owner now. Okay, I was going to say you're not 100. Kind of <laughs> it's, it's gone through three people. So I, I recently purchased that company. And then Gentox has been going about seven years. Um, so you're from originally from Utah? Yeah, and born and raised in Utah. Born and raised in Utah. And you've spent your whole life in Utah? My whole life. How do you like Utah? Love Utah. Love the seasons. I love that it doesn't have the traffic that California has. Um, I get all four seasons. I love the snow. Love the hot summers, but I want a mix of all the above. I don't want it <laughs> too hot all the time. Are, are you in the central Utah or your northern? I, just north of Salt Lake City. Yeah. Is that more mountainous or is that? The whole whole state's like really, really mountainous. I mean, it's got the big five national parks in the state, but yeah, it's, the whole thing's pretty mountainous. I mean, I my my house goes straight up behind me, so. Oh, does it really? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you, um, so you're down here on business. Yeah. Um, you were here most of the day. All day. Yeah, all I'll day. be here all day tomorrow too. I was here a couple months ago with you yeah. as well. Um, so how did you get into Gentox? Like, we, we, we that's, that's quite the story. I mean, I hope this podcast lasts a while. But uh, <laughs> no, I started it seven years ago um, out of my parents' living room. Wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> out of my parents' living room because I was busted broke at the time and mm. just built it up to where it is today. So uh, when you began, it was, um, you were just selling uh, medical supplies? Like what We were, were selling uh, laboratory testing, um, mm. just simple toxicology and uh, cancer screens and genetic type testing. And then we just kind of kept adding products to it. And I just kind of learned on the way. And so, so let me go a little back. So prior to Gentox, but where the idea of Gentox came from. So w when you go back, and I, I presume that you were doing something else prior to this, because you, you didn't... So I was a home builder for 16 years. Um, construction? Construction, built homes. Uh, I'm a pretty good, sizable home builder. Probably built 300 plus homes in my career, all in the 400 to $700,000 range. And that's, that's Utah money, not, oh, not California money. And that would be probably like that's, a 10 million California range. Yeah, <laughs> easily. <laughs> so it, it's more like in the 4,000 to 6,000 square foot home, if you can put that into perspective what California would be, but or wherever you're from. So I, I built that for years, and we were actually doing quite well. And then the whole 2008 market crash hit. And I had about 25 houses, spec homes sitting on the market. I had a full-on subdivision because I started my life back uh, when I was 21 as a concrete contractor, just pushing concrete. Nice. And I built myself into just doing remodeling, finishing basements, doing some remodeling work, some kitchen work, and then got into full-fledged home building, and then developed a couple of subdivisions, became a contracted developer. And then 2008 hit. But, but going, sorry, going back, but how did you even get into the concrete business? And where did that even, where did the um, idea bloom from? Well, I, I was always interested in, in home building. So I was going to college at the time. I was getting my degree in drafting, architectural drafting and architecture. I started my civil engineering degree oh. and started my first company. I mean, I always wanted to be self-employed and was it the money? Was it the self, uh, like that being your own boss? It was the being my own boss because I knew there wasn't a lot of money in concrete. <laughs> but 
I didn't want to answer to anybody either. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so was that actually like growing up, like where you, do you feel like your adolescence was pushing you towards this, like where you were? And I think my personality pushed me towards that because um, my, my parents were heavily conservative. I mean, they wouldn't be self-employed to save their lives. <laughs> I mean, they're the, the, the typical nine to five people. They would, wouldn't be caught dead with starting their own business. But um, and I feel my parents are like that too, actually, because my dad was working at, I think, the Mars factory, and then he went to the airline, and my mom was, I think she was working in a store, and then she went to the hospital. Yeah. So th then it's very different for people to think about how do you go into business, and when people are thinking, how's your idea, and people think, oh, you're going to do it? Well, this is normal for us. Yeah, to, it's normal for to, us. To, to be a normal job, work in the factory, work at the airport. My mom was always said, where did you come? Because all of us boys were like that kind of entrepreneur. Yeah. And she's like, where did you guys come from? Because we're like the farthest from entrepreneur, commission type income, self employed we're, we're like totally opposed to that. Mm -hmm. We're like, go get a job. Where'd you guys come from? And I'm like, I so, didn't so want the job. <laughs> so, so, you're, so you have siblings, so how many siblings do you have? Um, I'm the oldest of six. So I got uh, three brothers and two sisters. And did they go into entrepreneurship or was this? Yeah, my brother just younger me is a bounty hunter. Oh, is he really? Wow. <laughs> he kicks in doors for a living. Um, I'm my, surprised you didn't go in that direction no, without how you would scare me. <laughs> no, he no, he's even scarier than me. Um, and you're a tall guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's not very tall at all, but yeah, he, he, he'd kick your trash. But um, then my brother just younger than him um, worked for another company, but he was a salesman. I mean, he was commission-based sales guy and did extremely well. And my brother, just younger than him, um, is the CEO. He doesn't own the company, but he's, he manages yeah. a uh, auto co picture company. I mean, if you go to the top of the Empire State Building, you go to the Eiffel Tower, yeah. it's a worldwide company, and you get your picture taken and they sell it to you for yeah. 50 bucks. Yeah. That's that's a company he own, he manages. So the owner is a Turkish guy and you never see the owner. He, he manages the whole company. So, and then my other sister's a stay at home mom. And then my youngest sister actually started her own uh, grooming company wow. and she grooms dogs. Wow. <laughs> and she's six figures, well under six figures, and has a very, very large grooming company and started it from wow. scratch. So, yeah. You know, one of the things I wanted to interject and, and just maybe you and I should talk a little bit about it is his great grandfather was one of the founders of the Mormon church. Oh, wow. And he yeah, was really, very really? entrepreneurial. I mean, he was, he, I mean, he built Utah. So, and I joke with him that, that that's the blood that runs in him. <laughs> wow, yeah, I didn't like know, know that. Yeah. 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 He's the, he's what one was of the it, great was grandson of, of uh, Joseph, Smith. Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith, yeah. really? Yeah. yeah. Wow, that that's impressive. Yeah, I did that's not impressive. realize that. <laughs> <laughs> that's impressive. I built a whole, what, state and yeah. city. So, that's, yeah. I think that's where it comes from for, for but him. But, yeah, my... Um, yeah, my, it was just the farthest thing was true. So I started uh, going to college as, in, as in drafting and architectural drafting and stuff like that. And then I, I worked for a concrete contractor at the time. I just, I, I, I had served an LDS mission in, in Chile and uh, gotten home and needed a job. And that was the first one that hired me. And I just started pushing concrete. I really, I wanted to be in construction, but had no reason yeah. to, to take concrete for any reason. <laughs> but uh, learned it well and... Uh, within about two years of working for this concrete guy, I was like, I can do this and start my wow. first con company. Wow. So. so, so right now, so you're 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 in construction now. You're well, I was in construction. I'm not in now. Oh so. no, no, prior. So yeah. at that moment in your in your life, so you're in construction. Everything's going great. You're making good money. You're very happy. Things. Are, I, mean, I presume money is bringing you. I happiness. was living in an eight thousand square foot house, wow. one point five. I was doing just fine, and two thousand eight happened. Wow. So in 2008, the market crashed, and I was I'm, I'm in that situation. I was a, obviously a part of this in California, where my wife had passed away, and the house had uh, the market was collapsing. The house was collapsing. Everything was collapsing. It was bad. Everything was bad. Horrible. <laughs> so when you're in that moment and things are going bad, or you think like, oh my god, the construction business is going down, you're anticipating it coming back. Were you preparing for the worst? W I was trying to prepare for the worst as fast as possible because I we've. Construction always goes through lows and highs, right? And you're like, yeah, I was going to have a year or two of high, but uh, this was way different because the the lending dried up, mm -hmm. and so we we had customers who were wanting to come and purchase housing, but there's just no money. Yeah, and it, you could have stellar credit, there's just no money, and it just we it just dried up, and literally from 
just within months. I mean, it didn't I ever lived through 2008. It wasn't slowly slow decline. It just kind of just just popped down, pop plum, plummeted. And yeah. I went from doing really well to nothing, nothing, nothing. I couldn't. I couldn't afford to put gas in my car. Where, where was your mind when that was happening? Like, where, where was your mind knowing the fact that you couldn't put gas in your car? You it was just shocking. I'm just like, what do I do? I, I know how to do it. I know how to build. I know how to sell. I know how to do all this stuff. So the knowledge, the, the capacity, the, um, the work ethic, all, all was there. But there was just nothing in the market. There just no, it was just dead. And were you, uh, did you have kids at that time? Oh yeah, I've got four kids, my wife, yeah. Mm -hmm. So so going through this, being the man of the house, sh everything's on your shoulders, it's a uh, very- Well, the worst thing uh, too is that, that I went through a divorce at the same time, <laughs> same year. Oh, wow, that's <laughs> the, the chaos, right? Went man. through a divorce. And I was one well that started because she, she had a, uh, some anger issues that she wouldn't, wasn't willing to deal with and it, it, was, it was rough. Yeah. It was the worst year ever. I can imagine. Oh, I, I, I can imagine. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> Worst year ever. <laughs> so where you were, so your mind, you're, you're now, everything's going wrong. Wife problems, uh, money problems. What Are you praying? Are you... Oh, it, it got worse. Uh, you thought it? that way it got worse. <laughs> <laughs> what happened next? It got worse. So, and this is a story I really don't tell anybody. And it's shocking that I'm even telling it. So um, in my home building company, I had several, a lot of employees. I mean, I, it was pretty massive, a home building company. I had one of my employees embezzled about $6 million out of a, one of our construction loans. Oh. And, I, and honest to God, I had zero, zero part of it, as much as the, those people may be listening and may think otherwise, but I had zero part of it. And he had gotten in bed with uh, a bank officer, yeah. and they were washing checks. Okay. So they'd write it change the, the name of it and deposit it in their own bank accounts. And so he had, he had started a company by the exact same name as my company in Nevada. So I'm in Utah, he's in Nevada, right? And he was depositing those checks in Nevada, stole $6 million. And this is someone you trusted? I mean, he was my main manager for my company, one of the main guys. Like a punch and to the gut then, right? Yeah, he was, he was the, the office manager. He was helping managing the subcontractors. And so he was cutting checks to subcontractors and paying our subcontractors for building the houses, but at the same time, cutting checks to himself yeah. by writing checks to subcontractors, washing the check and then having it channeled towards himself. And you would never have expected him to ever never. do this because you trusted him, you gave him 99% trust or 100% trust. or 100% trust. trust. And he was doing it with my partner at the time. Oh. And my partner was not washing checks, but he was, uh, cause the whole market was crashing. He started uh, robbing Paul to pay Peter. So he's using one construction loan to pay off a project on another one, and you can't mix funds like that. Oh. And I didn't know he was mixing fun funds. In fact, I caught him once and sh told him to shut it down, but they went covertly, the two of them. And my employee was covertly kicking himself money. I mean, my partner didn't know about that part, but he was unknowingly facilitating it by robbing Paul to pay Peter. Oh. It just kind of helped him out. Wow. But the problem was is the... Uh, apparently the bank officer was doing it on several loans wow. and got detected by the feds. And then that's when the feds came knocking on my door. Wow. Wow. So it really did get bad. So <laughs> I went bankrupt, was going through the divorce and was being federally prosecuted at the same time. So where's your mind? Like, where are you? Like, I was, uh, I, uh, where yeah. do you feel your mind was? Like, were you saying, man, why me? Is this, why me? Well, I, I was just like, how am I going to get through this? What am I, what, what are my kids going to do? Uh, I mean, because, I mean, you have to understand the feds were threatening me with like 15 years in prison for, f for loan fraud. Wow. I mean, it was bad how bad I was going through. And I was like, man, I'm not going to see my kids grow up. I'm not, I'm not going to see anything. It's not just losing my home because I lost my house, yeah. lost everything. And now you'll um, be locked up and take it away and I'm take away your freedom. I'm going to be locked up and take my freedom. And if anybody's been in the federal system, I mean, it's you think the, the legal system in the country is above board right and that's yeah. the farthest from the truth if you've ever gone through the legal system you you'll understand how corrupt it really is it's a good old boy network where the judges know the, the attorneys and everything else like that and it's just they're all just making deals and they're not really supporting you you their client because yeah. i mean the judge went to law school with my attorney and they knew each other and they knew the prosecutor, and it was a it was a U.S. prosecutor. It was it was it was bad. And then you see your attorney having a good laugh in front of you, and you're saying, "Man, I'm crying on the inside," and here you are laughing by the stand. Yeah, I've, I've seen it. I went down a hundred grand overnight in law in fees, 
uh, ended up dropping my attorney and going uh, CGA, which is a public defender, and yeah. they weren't worth their grain of Not salt. Either. And so I, ha I had no money at the time, no nothing, depending on a public defender, trying to get through this, trying to go through a divorce, trying to not go to jail and try to find a place to live and ended up um, moving back in with my parents, which was wow. humiliating as it and was. How, how old were you when this was happening? Um, this, I mean, it, it started in 2008 when the housing market crashed and then the legal case went clear to 2013. So you were how old? You were um, I'm 45 now, so it's uh, eight years ago. So I was late 30s. Late 30s. Wow, and that's the time you should have been just coasting, right? I should have been coasting, should have been coasting. But um, um, we 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 had taped records of my partner and my employee saying that I was involved. I mean, actually on tape, recorded, wow. and the prosecutors didn't care. It just they just wow. threw it out. That's crazy. It, it was crazy. And uh, since I didn't have any money at the time, I we ended up because uh, they kept coming at me. Well, you're going to do four years, and they'd come yeah. at me. Well. Or they, they came out and we said, you're going to do 13 years. And I, I fought it and I fought it. And a year later, they said, well, you're going to do seven years. Well, we'll give you seven. I'm like, I'm not doing <laughs> seven years. <laughs> my, my, yeah, I didn't do it. Hard. I'm innocent. But it, like I was just saying, in the federal system, it's not innocent until proven guilty. It's guilty until proven yeah. less guilty. And now it's a web of stuff that just keeps getting at you. Yeah, because the, 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 the saying over there is, is you can indict a ham sandwich. But also, once you're indicted, you're done. It's not a matter of if you're serving time; it's how much time you're going to be serving. Wow! It's wow. it's it just it, the, the in, you talk to any federal prosecutor. And this is not state; this is federal. Yeah. You talk to any federal attorney; they're going to say, "No, the, f the feds got you by the balls, and you're you're not getting out." So, is your mind? So, which problem is your mind on at this point? Is your mind on the <coughs> the lawsuit? My is your mind on the divorce? Is your mind on my mind is mud <coughs> at the time. I mean, wow. I I'm, I'm a grown man. There were several nights I was crying myself to sleep. It was bad, and because I didn't know what to do at all. It was it was bad. Wow. So do you, so at that moment, are you talking to your friends, family, parents? Yeah, Who, who's I have supporting you. My parents and my friends, I mean, I had really, really close friends. Uh, I had just met him at the time, and he, he was being a close friend. And, and that's so Frank, right? That's <laughs> Frank. <laughs> um, yeah, and I was trying to, to, to pick myself back up again. And, and um, I mean, it started in 2008, and the, the legal case out lasted until 2013. And I had picked myself up a little bit and started yeah. to make some money. And I was actually trying to purchase his company at the same time to get myself back on the feet. And... Um, um, and then my attorney came to me one day and says, look, um, they're going to add, because we're, we're beating the charges. They had given me 25 charges. Wow. Each one's like four years. And we were beating all of them. He says, we're winning all of them. He says, but they're going to come up with another 25 charges. That's what they just told us. So h how do you focus? Like, how do you focus with this? Like, you've got so much going on. How, how the heck are you focusing? <laughs> like, like I, I, I'm concerned for you right now. I'm sure, you I'm sure a lot of people uh, uh, have gone through something like this. You just take it a day at a time. You, you get up in the morning, you put your clothes yeah. on, and you go do what you can. You go to bed at night, you try to get some sleep, and you do it again the next day. I mean, wow. what else is there? I mean, wow. you're not escaping it. There's yeah. no place to run to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you, you breathe, you eat, and you... So you just do, think, do what you can. So you weren't going to pack the sack and then head to Mexico? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's where I would be going. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I had my kids, and so I'm trying oh, to still true. be a good father. I'm still trying to go to, to school activities and school functions. I mean, my kids were in elementary school at the time, and they've yeah. got talent shows and stuff like that. You still got to do and put a grin on your face and yeah. say you're on, things are fine. I mean, they, right. they can't know that the world's falling apart at yeah. that age. So. Wow. so, okay, so you beat the lawsuit. I didn't. Oh, you didn't. Okay, so we. <laughs> so no, what, did, what did they give no, you? No, they gave me seven and a half months in federal prison. Wow, how was that? Well, that's. It was bad. So, you ever heard of uh, Florence, Colorado, yeah. where the supermax is? I mean, that's where yeah. the, the the Unabomber is, and all the bombers out there. So, there's a camp right next to it, and I was in that camp right next to the mat supermax for seven and a half months. Wow. Okay, so. You get your seven and a half months and you start going to prison. Anticipation of what's coming next. So when you're walking through those doors, you obviously they take you from the court, I presume. No, they, they, they made me drive myself. Oh, they drive yourself? <laughs> they, it was, <laughs> was it Uber was, out the back then? Yeah. <laughs> no, my, my, my dad and my wife at the time, we, we drove to Colorado, showed up at the prison because it was self 
turn yourself in, basically. Wow. And drove me up, and I walked in. And where was your nerves at the second going in? Where, where's your nerves? Oh, what, what's prison like? I mean, federal prison like that. I'm like, who am I going to be with? How is this going to work out? Um, my wife's now living with my parents. My kids are with my ex. <laughs> They're not going to see me. I'm going to. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to talk to them on the phone. I mean, right. just it. It was the bottom. It oh. was the rock bottom. And so for something I didn't even do it either. So I I, I know that the prison. I, I, I've been to county, but very very short time. No, and you haven't been to federal prison. <laughs> federal is a lot worse. <laughs> the county was bad enough. Yeah. But like the idea of when you get there and they, you know, you have to take your clothes off and then they say, "Here's your fresh underwears. Here's your suit." Here's your flip flops. Here's your socks, yeah. and don't put the blanket over your head when you're lying in the bed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the worst how, how part was uh, bend over and spread it. But when yeah. you go ahead. Oh, see, they went all that, all <laughs> out with you. That, it was not all that when going into federal prison. It was bad. So, so when you get in there, and now your first day in there, how was that? It was happened? a whirlwind. For whirlwind, absolute whirlwind, because you have no idea. You got a little caught. Wow. Just you have no idea who you went. I don't even eventually you make some friends and you start talking it out, but. Um, um, there was only one riot while I was there, or, and I kind of tried to avoid that because it was bad. Keep your head down. <laughs> keep your head down. Keep walking. Um, they had a, a, an infirmary uh, on the side of the, the court where you could go out and play basketball and stuff like that, and they were literally lining up bodies. <laughs> wow. So, so how was your day? Like, how was your normal day in prison? And I know that you, this is a fast tracking of your life, but your day in prison. You're, you're, um, you're there they made you thing. work, and so they, you were assigned in a, a job, an assignment, because it was a camp. I mean, it was a camp. It wasn't like you were behind bars. Um, you, you're in a big room with a whole bunch of other guys, and you had to do projects all day long. And so I had the contractor background, so they're always having me fix stuff around plumbing or whatever. So I mean, your you construction skills were coming into uh, into play then. Obligated, <laughs> obligated play because they, they, they said, okay, what are you going to do? You have to work. Yeah. And so, and they, they paid us 25 cents an hour. Oh, wow. <laughs> you, you definitely appreciate minimum wage there when you yeah. came out, right? Yeah, that was our, that was our wage in there. So, um, so, so like, so that you're getting there, you're, they're telling you, okay, so every day you're going to uh, get up, Go do the, the jobs up, that they're you giving go you. Go to breakfast. And you have to do six, seven hours worth of assignments. Did, they, the did they have a clock, or you weren't able to tell the time? Because I think when no, you had a watch. Oh, they give, oh you have wow. Yeah, the lad has a, I have a watch. Were on you by the, yourself in a room, or were there like two? two no, rooms? there was like no, there was like fifty guys in one big room, and oh, there was wow. there were cinder block cubicles, is what they were. Wow, wow. So. You're there for four months, five months, six months, seven months. Seven and a half months. Now you're feeling like you're a part of the, the joint. <laughs> part of the joint. <laughs> oh, I actually did fit quite. I mean, I, 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 I mean, this is nothing. I had it clear down here because right. I just decided not to shave, and so I just let it go. And it was, and I, I looked, and I, of course, I'm, I'm bald. I don't have any hair, so, and so I was this bald guy with a long beard. I looked pretty rough in there, and no one messed with me. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> So okay, so are you exercising in there? Are you thinking about? Uh, it? That's all I did. I mean, you, you, I was, I was a pretty big boy, man. I was, you, you just, you, when you weren't doing your assignments, you're playing basketball or playing cards or lifting weights, wow. and just to spend time. So, with everything that's gone on, with you being in there, so you have a long period of time in there, right? Mm -hmm. Where's your mind on where you just came from? Like, were you thinking about where you just came from? I came from. Millionaire status, big 8,000 square foot house, nice place, and just lost everything in less than a year. It was. And were you thinking about it on a regular basis? Were you thinking about how am I going to make a comeback? What happens when I, I get so out? What am I going to do when I get out? How's the market like? What am I going to do to get my kids back? Because I had custody of my kids going in yeah. and lost it because of that. And so I had to go, I, I'd have to go through a new custody battle and everything like that. Um, uh, you, have to get back on my feet, have to get back in the house. I mean, everything. What, what am I going to do for a living? Is construction still it is? Am I going to have to go back to concrete work? I, mean, I don't know. So you don't know what's going on right <laughs> now. So I, I mean, you're trying to make plans because you have a lot of time to think about it. You're trying to make, well, I was pretty smart business, business planner, and I'm like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. So the day comes, and the day is to leave. So I leave, um, and so how, how's that feeling first? Like I want to get the the walking out of this room. Walking and who out, who tells you like, oh. it's time? 
So yeah, so uh, you don't have a cross on the calendar every day. You're not that guy. No, no, or, I didn't or, or have they that. beat you up. For well, that. they do really tell you because uh, I mean, my my sentence was a year and a day, <laughs> and obviously they're gonna let you on good behavior and stuff, all that kind of stuff. And so I only did seven and a half months, but they didn't come out. It was like maybe 20, 30, 20 25 days before they let me out. Oh, by the way, wow. we're gonna let you out. I'm like, great. Wow. And so yeah, twenty five days can come soon enough, and yeah, so I walk. Grab out. your stuff, and they follow me. You at the door, and now you're yeah, they, to they, you Yeah, um, they stick you in a van and they drive you to the nearest bus stop. <laughs> Did they buy the ticket at least? Yeah, they or bought the ticket, but I, I had my parents come pick me up. Okay. <laughs> so they drove out there again. Um, How was it? Obviously, seven months is a, is a long but they time. They had to pick you at the bus stop because they, they won't let you go anyplace else but there. So you, they dropped off at the bus stop, and my parents had to go to the bus stop to <laughs> pick me up. <laughs> So, so like being there for such a long time and coming out, like obviously people get institutionalized, right? It's like with this COVID stuff, like everyone's locked down and you forget what the world is, like going uh, to a it, restaurant. It was rough. It was rough. I mean, um, you're coming out and you're like, okay, now I got to get, I got to start from scratch. I got nothing. I don't have two cents in my name. My my wife was living with my parents at the time. My, my kids were with my ex. Um, um even living with my parents, we still had bills and stuff like that from previous. And so oh. she had racked up the credit cards a little bit. So we were up at twenty five, thirty thousand dollars in debt and credit cards by the time I got out. And that was just in seven and a half months. And so, yeah, that was, so I was looking you're at You're below zero now. You're at, you're at a <laughs> negative standing <laughs> point. A negative standing point coming out. Wow, that's tough. It was bad. That's rough. Um, okay, so, you, so you're now, you're out. You had your first breakfast at home at your parents' house. Wife is there. Pancakes. It was the best thing in the world. Was it just fill them up? <laughs> just fill them up. Strawberries on top, and wow. you don't know how bad prison food is. <laughs> <laughs> so you must have enjoyed that. <laughs> um, so now you're you're there. How long before you start figuring out what you're going to do next? Um, like, so they, they they forced me to go to halfway house. Who, who forces you? The, the prison system. So, so you get you get out in seven and a half months, and then you, you're required to spend I think a m month or two in the halfway house. It's required. You wow, can't. I didn't know that. Even if you have a home, you have a place to go to. They, no, it's required. You have to go to the halfway house. And is that for a probation officer to watch you to make sure that you're okay? And was that the transition? I, I out think it's prison? a it's a forced transition because you, you I went from halfway house to probation officer. You don't you don't have a probation officer at the time when you're in the halfway house, but you're still in the in a correction system at the halfway house. Wow. You're not released to probation yet. But you can, in the halfway house, you're allowed to go out when you want, right? You're only allowed to go out to work. And so. And then you come back to the halfway house? You have to come back to the halfway house, you're out. Of, and so how many people are there with you? Uh, there had to have been 100 people in the building, guys and guys and girls both. So is this like a house or this is like a. It's a, a building downtown Salt Lake. And so I was released from Colorado to downtown Salt Lake. So my, obviously my wife can come visit me and it's a lot, lot closer. And, I, I would sneak out of my job and go, go home for a few <laughs> minutes and have some lunch and stuff like that all the time. Or go, and go see my kids, uh, get off work early or something like that. But they knew my work schedule. so it's. And at that moment now, did they provide you work or now you're finding no, your No, the work? first thing they make you do is go find a job. And so they, they give you computers and you have to go on job hunt and stuff like that. And I found a low little concrete job pushing concrete. Oh, so you're back to the concrete? Pushing concrete when I first started out with. Full circles. Full circle, yeah, that's right. I was making 15 bucks an hour pushing concrete. Well, it's definitely an improvement from your 25 cents. <laughs> definitely an improvement. But, but the ex-wife was taking the whole thing anyway, so. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Child support. So, so you're doing this, so how long now are you in the halfway house? Two months. Two, two months, months in the halfway house. house before they released me back, to, back, to, back home. And so who tells you that you can go back home? Um, they just give you a date. So I got out July 25th, and they released me September 15th out of the halfway house. Okay, so you, you've left the halfway house. You, do you I'm keep, working concrete. You, you kept the same job? Yeah. 15, I, so you kept that job while you went back to your parents' house? Uh-huh. And you're at this, and you're at this, if you're 39, 40? Uh, yeah, so yeah, this at is that point? 2015, no, 2014. 2014, so 21, six years ago, seven years ago. I was 38. 38. So now who you were before, like let's just say where you're going back prior to this, so you're the guy living in the million dollar house, million dollar business. <clears throat> you're jumping forward to losing everything. Nothing's left. You're the $15 an hour guy, <laughs> right? It was a joke. What changed inside you? Like what, from what you were there or where your mind was, 
and that, hu- that obviously is humbling. But well, getting out was exhilarating. I mean, just the, the the freedom you have when you don't you're not told what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and you're not standing up for roll call three times a day to make sure you're still yeah. there. I mean, it was, uh, it was, I came out with a lot of determination. I, I knew where I was and I'm like, I got to figure out how to get back there. So yeah. I don't care what I have to do. Climb that ladder. I'm climbing Find the, rope. the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't kill anybody on the way Just so that you don't have to go back in. Go, go back in yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So you're, you're, you're back now. You've gone to your parents' house. Uh, you're determined to figure out what's the path. I presume that while you're doing your concrete, you're, you're, you're planning in your brain. I'm trying to figure out something to do. Uh, the yeah. construction industry wasn't all the way back. Um, I didn't want to get back into real estate because real estate was pretty cutthroat at the time. It was definitely not the, the opportune market. I think the, the financial system changed and it made it yeah. harder for people to get houses rather than those loans saying, yeah. hey, I make a million, give me, give me give two me, houses. Well, give me whatever you want. And yeah. I mean, now the housing market is bon- crazy yes. right now this year, but... Um, it, it, it wasn't where I could just get back into contracting again. Okay. Um, I had a five-year probation, and my probation officer was just down my neck. And so, uh, yeah, you couldn't yeah, – part of my probation was I couldn't be self-employed. Oh, you couldn't? That's a part of the probation? Yeah, I couldn't be self-employed. Wow. So now you really are tied up. I was really tied up. and uh, But I did it anyway, and – because <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I mean, what couldn't are you gonna do? Money. I mean, you're 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 coming out of your. You basically set up to fail. In other words, you're set right? up to because fail. how are you gonna succeed? Fifty dollars yeah, an hour. Well, got a kid, uh, kids. You got a wife. You can't. Well, do go go try getting a job and passing a back background check after that. No, I'm done. You, you're, you're done. done. You're done. You're, you'll never get something more than fifty. I mean, if I'm, I'm sure there are some people out there that are, yeah, I'm, I've been in prison or something like that, and going through the same thing, just yeah. like. What do, what do I do? I can't pass a background check. I'm never going to make more than fifteen dollars an hour for the rest of my life, and that's that's. I, I can believe it. That's what you're facing. I can believe it, and I've seen it. We have people here who've come out of prison, who they're working here, and they've they, they struggle to find work. They have to be in a certain area because we do background checks on TSA to mm. to work on certain air cargo versus transloading. It's uh, it's we, we have to be very decisive. No but one I'm trusts a, you. Yes, no one trusts you. No one trusts you. And I'm one of those people who. I believe that everyone has the ability to change. Like yeah. some of the things don't really make sense of it, of what happens to people, how the system looks at you. I, I believe in giving people chances. I believe. I, I learned a lot while I was in there too, because there's a lot of guys in. There. I mean, I was. I mean, I'm one, maybe one of the few guys that was actually 100 percent innocent going yeah. in, because I mean, I had an employee that embezzled the money, and they just they just they, they came in with a net. Yeah. And they had to get it, everybody right. They they, get, they got me. They got my partner. They got my employee. They got a few other people. They just. They, I mean, the feds don't care. Yeah. Um, and they don't care who they hurt or what they hurt. And they, I mean, it's strictly the numbers. I mean, it's they, they say that um, uh, the feds win 99% of their cases, yeah. and 97% them. of them are plea deals, so they, they never see a courtroom. Yeah, And it's because they just have so much power. And so, um, yeah, I mean, my hands are really tied, but I'm like, I, I can't live off of $15 an hour. I will live in my parents' basement for the rest of my life if I don't get out of $15 yeah. an hour wage. And if I can't pass a background check, guess what I'm doing? I'm going against probation and yeah. becoming self-employed. Yeah. And so I had to keep, I mean, it was some ingenuity to keep that from a probation officer. And a lot of people know I'll piss off a probation officer back in. So I was, yeah. I was taking some really big, some would consider stupid risk, but what else would I was going to do? I, 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 I had to support my family. How, how is the feeling with the probation officer? Because a lot of them, they're known for having a big ego. So now all of a sudden Tremendous treat, ego. Treating you like dirt, treating you like the scum of the earth, and expecting you to bow down every time they come into a room, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly what that, that's exactly <laughs> what it is. It was... It was yes. yes, sir, I yes, did sir, it. You know, yes, sir. No, no, sir. Got it. Um, and they just they call you up and around, boo, I need to see you. You need to be here in an hour. You had to drop what you're doing. You had to go. I mean... It, oh, ridiculous. <laughs> that's unfair. That's unfair. Yeah. Um, so now you're moving on with your with your life. So you know you got your fifteen dollar an hour. You're back at your parents' house. Where? What's your next move now for you to get I back? I was trying on your to feet? find a job that where I didn't have to go through a background check. So I was specifically looking for ten ninety nine self employed yeah. jobs, right? Um, something I could do. I, I was thinking about starting my own business again because that's what I, that's all I knew my whole life. And, and, and what was the thought? What business were you having in your mind? Were you, were you thinking was, construction or you think I was looking at construction, but I was looking more at business because I, I, I enjoy construction. I love building. I love doing things with my hands, but I love business management more. I love being seeing the big picture and going big picture and 
and like, uh, what can I build? What can I do that's that's big picture or picture oriented? And my first thought was his, his company, and because I had probably I tried buying it before that, and that was more big picture. But now I, I had no way of getting it. There's but no way I could get any financing to buy something that big. Um, so do, do you call Frank at this point? Well, we were <laughs> we were friends at the time, but uh, there was um, nothing he could do to help me out. But um, so I had another friend down in Arizona that introduced me to a medical company that where I could become a commission sales guy. And, and so this is in what year? Um, 2015. 2015, okay. 14, 2014, 2015. Uh, into 2014. So, 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 how did, so, so somebody you knew, knew that you were going into, like knew about medical? Yeah, he, he was friends of mine before, I, uh, been a long friend, and he was actually selling for the company and said, hey, why don't you come try doing this? Okay. I knew nothing about medical. I mean, absolutely nothing. I didn't know what a podiatrist was. I didn't know. I didn't even know what uh, geriatric meant. I, I had. I had never seen a doctor. I was. I'm a Your physician at first. Doctor at first. I don't go see doctors. I don't see, take medications. I'm nothing. No. I had no no knowledge. I was a hammer and nail guy, right? And I knew nothing. I think it's about the masculinity medical. in guys, right, where they don't <laughs> want to go and they would be lose a leg and uh, maybe I'll go now. <laughs> I'd, I'd, be, I'd have to be bleeding out and dying to go to the doctor's <laughs> office, right? And my, my parents or my wife would have to drag me kicking and screaming because I, I didn't like doctors. Dennis, even worse, jeez. Um, but no, so I, I knew nothing. I'm like, medical? Medical? I <laughs> know nothing about anything medical. Screw it, I'll try it. I had nothing else to lose, right? That's it. And nothing else to lose. Anything was better than $15 an hour. There's no way I'm supporting it. Do you have reservation in your mind saying, should I be doing this? Should I not? Should I? I have a ton yes. of reservations. I'm like, huh? what do I know about medical? Like, seriously, I know nothing. And they wanted me to go get a job selling genetics. And out of everything medical, I have to get into DNA and genetics. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm flunk chemistry in, in school. I mean, I know nothing about medical. Yeah. No, so I, I went and started selling DNA. And I would literally go up to doctor's offices and grab my phone and Google what the doctor was, what did he do, because I, I needed to know what endocrinology was, what medicines, family practices, because I knew family practice practiced common colds and flus, maybe yeah. a broken bone or two, but I had no idea what other stuff they did. Yeah. And so I was literally outside of doctor's offices reading the name on the plate and what they did and reading Wikipedia, well, what is that, and how do they do it? And that's how I, I, I essentially self-taught myself. Wow. Because they, they, the company, as a 1099 rep, they really didn't have any training. So, so you're just going from door to door, selling medical DNA kits? Testing, yeah. Testing so kits. there was a laboratory. It was a laboratory. They did the testing. You'd go and sell the service. They'd take... So you're trying to accumulate a book of business, and that's what you're doing, right? Yeah, so they'd send, okay. send their stuff to the laboratory. The laboratory would run the tests, send the re test results back to the doctor. Doctor would build the insurance company, get paid, or the laboratory would build the insurance company and get paid, and then they'd pay me a commission, right? Wow. So I was a commission salesman. Wow. Wow. Selling medical testing. So, and how's that working out? So, are you breaking the $15 an hour barrier right now, or are you still progressing? Like the first seven or eight, nine months, I just nothing. I was just ready to quit. Well, not necessarily ready to quit, but it was, it was hard because um, I was learning on the fly. I was studying, reading up what I could on Wikipedia or other f internet stuff. I, I was just basically just reading everything, get my hands on so I could learn about it, so I could actually talk to a doctor. Yeah. Because I mean, you, you're, you're going up against some guy that's been to school for 10 years about this and practicing who, who knows how long. I'm a novice. And they could tell a novice, right, great, and they'd just stop talking to you. Ah, I, I, I got to go. Yeah, I Sorry. And they'd walk away from you, right? Yeah. You're never going to sell anything like that. So. Yeah. You have to be in front of a doctor and go toe to toe with him and talk his language and yeah. make yourself come off like a peer. Yeah, it's it's like when we do freight sales, right? Like we got to know what we're doing. We have to know about the ocean. We have to know about pier paths. Yeah. We have to know about drage. We have to know about all of this because otherwise people see right through you and they say, "This guy's supposed to be the professional, but he looks like a like a joke." He looks like a joke. And I think that's an important part of sales. And so, so, do you get to that level? I got to that level real fast. Okay. With a lot of effort, and that's what it is—just effort. They didn't start calling you doctor at that one point. <laughs> um, <laughs> a couple of years later, they did. <laughs> I can believe it. <laughs> a couple, I, I I got accused all the time because I got really good at it. Wow. So, where are you financially now? Are you still at home? Well, I'm still with my parents. Okay, oh, so totally. Is, and how, at what point? So it's seven, eight months before you start. So you were saying that you had seven, eight months. Well, I started making some money. 
I some think. money. So a couple thousand bucks a month. I went from a couple hundred bucks a month at $15 an hour, right? To uh, I started getting some test results coming in, some commissions coming in, and um, I kind of was thinking, I'm like, this this is this is a lot of work. This is a lot of work for, and the commissions weren't massive. I mean, it's you're talking about laboratory testing, but uh, running a business for as long as I did, I would get on training calls, and they were so-called training. They were horrible. They weren't really training at all, and I. I'd see how the guys were running the laboratory, running the business, the sell side of things, and they really didn't know what they're doing. I'm like, I, I, I don't know a ton about medical, but I know a lot more than they do about running a business and running sales. So I said, I'm gonna. So you're seeing opportunity here, right? So this, is this where the I'm first gonna, spark of opportunity comes into you? This is spark. I'm like, I can do this myself. Wow. And how crazy is that? You don't know a jack squat about medical, and you're already thinking about starting your own business doing medical. Yeah. And you're going against a probation officer. You're not supposed to be self-employed. So wow. I was like, "Wow." <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is where now. So you're seven, eight months, nine months into this. You have the spark to ignite to see an opportunity. What's your first move? Um, my first move was to um, get myself incorporated. So I went and got myself incorporated. Fifty bucks down the state. Um, kept on studying and I started calling laboratories. And, say, and what you're selling them, the DNA kits now or what, you, what are you selling them now? Are you still with DNA kits? Yeah, I was still doing the same thing. Just okay. uh, DNA testing, cancer testing, uh, toxicology screenings, stuff like that. Um, and I started calling laboratories and say, hey, can I be, can my company contract with you? And I just try to get contracted work. So I wasn't really working for the lab. I was a company that was trying to bring the lab in as a, as a, essentially as a vendor. So were you doing this from your parents' house still? So you're still no, at your still parents, my house. parents' house. So the company's off, income starts when? When do you get your first like um, sign off? Like, oh man, like well, I, I got a nice I check. I kicked butt. I, I, I went out there because I worked a lot harder and that was my thing. So I was working even harder than I was before. I was working pretty hard before. I had a pretty good work ethic. And, and so I went out there and I was visiting um, probably 10, 20 doctors a day, borrowing money. My mom, because uh, half the time you have to go visit a doctor, you have to bring them lunch, and so you have to put up, poke up money. And yeah. if you're working for some big company, they give you a, a lunch allowance to go feed the doctors, right? Butter them up is what they call it. Butter them up, yeah. <laughs> so my, my, my wife has got a job. She's a school teacher, and then uh, uh, my parents are giving me money, and I'm literally going to Subway sandwiches and stuff like that and buying just as enough <laughs> to feed a few doctors and some office workers just to get the cells going and so, so so you're so you're getting this going when does your first like big like i made a big i made a sale this is this I, where's your first point of saying that well, okay I this got was worth it probably about five or six months after i started it, i started seeing some pretty decent income coming from it um at least you, enough you're, you're over a year now into this then if you're starting mm -hmm. to see income right well yeah. this industry maybe. in the in the industry yeah over a year yeah and going from knowing nothing to yeah. Making an income off. Are, of are you still thinking about who you once were? Are you still thinking about? I oh, every, your, day. Uh, every, every day, every wow. day, just determination. Should, should I go back to that? And I'm no. just, I just every time I look back at real estate, I was like, <laughs> now I'm not saying real estate's bad, but for me, it was just it was depressing. So I didn't want to go back into it. <laughs> <laughs> but with the lifestyle, so you want to be back in that lifestyle. So you're 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 feeling the burn, like you really want to go. The eagerness is in you. You're trying to go forward. Do you feel like you're still like trying to push through? Like, are you? You've got your business started, but are you really trying to like really go hardcore? I need to get to the next I level. Had, when, when is this? I wanted to get to a level where I never really uh, thought I would get as big as I am now. I really didn't. I, I thought I would get big. I, I'd, I'd make a decent living, maybe get into a decent house. And uh, at the time, I was really just thinking, I just need to support my family. If I can just put food on the table, put food on the table, get the place. Pay, pay a rent, <laughs> pay a car payment. Pay my mom back all the sandwiches that she's been paying for for the last exactly. six months. Exactly, and just if I can just and if I could just make that man, I was I was thinking, man, if I can just make four thousand, five thousand dollars a month, I'd be fine. I could survive. Um, but knowing me, I just I I'm more ambitious than that. Yeah. So nothing is ever enough, and so I I I got a lot of clients, my own clients. And then uh, uh, with the little money I had, I started putting job boards out. And job, what do you mean job boards? Job boards for hiring other salesmen. Oh, okay. So you, okay. So you're trying to recruit now. Uh, so now I, I got to start recruiting. I got to make myself, I got to double, triple me 
And so I started recruiting. So strategy is kicking in now saying, okay, how do I make this thing bigger? How do I make this thing bigger? And yeah. so I just started putting some people out there and, um, and then I went from knowing nothing about medical to actually training other people how to sell medical. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you were making a fleet of pros. <laughs> making a fleet of pros. And within, once I hit that curve, I went from just me to having about 20 people Wow. Within about two or three months, I, I had hired that many people in, in, in all different states. It wasn't Utah. It was a lot of different states, and they're all out there selling it. And it, it more than, I mean, 20 times me real fast. So. so, And they were all succeeding immediately, or you had people dropping off in between? That oh, yeah. It was, there was a massive, massive drop, drop off in, in 1099 sales reps. And so out of every 10 people I'd hire, maybe two stuck with it. Wow. And to actually, I mean, the, 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 the one thing I struggled with the whole time I was hiring people was just work ethic. I mean, I put a sick amount of time into studying and just uh, becoming the expert at it because I, I knew I, if I wasn't standing in front of that doctor and talking his lingo, if I looked green, I was just, there's the door, right? Yeah. And the one thing I found is there's a lot of people wanting a 1090 position, wanting that freedom. But not don't put the work in, right? No, not the work ethic. Yeah, we, I we, mean, we've experienced that too. So we've hired salespeople and you've got people who are really gunning it and they're doing well. And then you've got people who keep dropping off and they put, they think it's going to come very easy because they know how to say hello to someone, but they don't put the work in to even to understand how the business functions. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And then that's, that's the biggest thing. If you don't have the work ethic, you're not going to get anywhere in life. No. You got to have some serious work ethic. And just because you're 1099, just because you're working for someone else doesn't mean the, the work ethic drops. It's not the paycheck just doesn't show up. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the nine to five mentality, right? That's, yes. That's what I got away from. My, my parents had that nine to five. Nothing against my parents, but <laughs> that, it's that nine to five. It's just not suited for everybody. There's yeah, certain exactly. people it's good for and there's certain people it's not. So, okay, so you've got now your 20 reps. Mm -hmm. You're going out there, you're expanding. Are you back to where you were or are you? Oh, I was far from it. I was at the time getting maybe five or six, seven thousand dollars a month. But the toxicology, the, the, the laboratory business was very volatile. I mean, yes. some months I had really good, some months were not so good, and so I was having to float a lot of months. Feast and famine, right? Yeah, feast and famine type stuff. And it was surprising how, how much it fluctuated. And I thought, well, to or get rid of the fluctuation, I need to add more product lines. I need to do more stuff. I, I can't depend on just one or two or three product lines. And so that's when I started saying, well, what would interest me? What would I find fascinating? And <coughs> the one thing in the medical industry I found really, really fascinating was imaging. Mm. Ultrasound machines, x-rays. I, I thought imaging was cool. Yeah. I like I, machines. Let's go sell some machines and lasers. And so technology, right? Technology. And so I went and started studying ultrasounds and x-rays and lasers. Wow. Self-taught myself um, to the point where, uh, I mean, this is, Within two years, I had designed my own laser, and oh. I actually have my own laser being manufactured in China right now. Wow, wow! A therapeutic laser. So, and it's, it's just it's just studying. Wow. No school, no universities, just just getting it done. Just self teaching myself, finding opportunity, going for opportunity. Yep. Um, so you got your twenty people. You're you're expanding now. You're making your seven eight thousand dollars a month. Are you two years into this? Are you three years into um, this? How how far I'm are you? I'm probably I'm. A, probably two and a half, almost three years into it. Okay. Three years into it. And I'm adding, I, I, I got an agreement <coughs> with MindRay and started selling MindRay machines. And what, what do you mean MindRay machines? MindRay is a big ultrasound manufacturer. Okay. I mean, they're, they're pretty big. They're like Philips or GE. Got it. Okay. Um, they're, they're a pretty big company. Um, so I got a contract with, with MindRay and then I, I just started contacting companies. I, I got an, I pulled in an ECG machine. I pulled in a couple X-ray companies that said, "Hey, we, we won't mind you selling for us." Oh. Um, pulled in a couple other services and added uh, um, Phillips. I finally contacted Phillips, and Phillips started letting me sell for them oh. a little bit here and there. Um, and it was just making phone calls and starting at the bottom. I, I'd look up the websites, yeah. <laughs> call an eight hundred number, and work my way up until I could find somebody who had yeah. some decision making authority and say, "Hey, I." I want to sell your product. What wow. do I need to do to become contracted wow. with you? And that's what I did. And then I, and w where's your business right now? At that moment, your business now is uh, what we're, we're talking about, like what? 10 million in revenue, 7 million. Where, where are oh, you? Oh, not right? even close. I was doing maybe um, um, a half a million to 1 million a year now. Wow. And people think just because you're doing a million dollar in revenue doesn't mean you're a millionaire. It just means that you're taking a tiny piece no, of that. Exactly. So I was, yeah, I was doing 
yeah, 60, 70, 80,000 a uh, year, maybe I, I, one year I think I tipped over six figures. Wow. But it, I mean, it was not massive money. It's, yeah. It, 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 it's, it's, you have to understand, we weren't selling uh, a machine every single day. We were, it's like one a month, two a yeah. month, or something like that. And I mean, doctors don't buy those big ticket items very often. And, yeah. and you're talking on laboratory tests, and you're making $2, a dollar a test. Yes. So you have to have a significant amount of volume. Yes. To be able to make any real income. And it's not just now I'm paying commissions. And so it's not just my income. I'm having to split that and give reps, representatives commissions. And then, yeah. um, and so the business is progressing. You're making some money. Mm -hmm. You're paying the bills. At this point, I presume you've moved into your apartment. And you're um, uh, yeah, I, probably within three years of that, I, I went and rented a house, moved my family into a house. And so you get into the house, you're just coasting now? Are you just, business is progressing it's, or are you still it's gunning enough, it? It's enough where I know I have a paycheck every single month. Okay, so you ha you're content right now. Right I'm now you said, okay, I'm, I'm in a decent place. I'm, a I'm a content. And it took me three and, a half, three and a half years. So we went from these jumps from 25 cents to $15. Now we're going into $3,000, $4,000. Now we're hitting the $7,000, $8,000 mark. Yeah. And it's, it's slowly getting better. It's, it's, I'm, I'm breathing. I'm like, okay. ah, I'm, I'm not freaked out like I was four or five years earlier. Got it. <laughs> I'm not like <laughs> the mud has cleared. To sleep. I'm not <laughs> trying to think of well, what am I going to do next? I'm. It, it, it's just where you just put your your nose to the grindstone. Wow. And you just you just put your head down and work. Wow. <laughs> so so now okay so you, we're going on now. Business is growing. Uh huh. You're getting much, much better. Where do you see a break in your company where you think, okay, my company's becoming something? Hmm. When, when, when does Probably about five years into it. Okay, so you're five years in. So you're comfortable, you're, you're, just, you're, just, con you're just content right now for four. Five years into it, I, I'm up to about uh, 60 sales reps. Wow. Uh, 50, 60 sales reps. And that, that fluctuated depending on who quit and who didn't that month. Um, I've got probably 16, 17 different product lines. I've got a lot of imaging, a lot of lasers. I've got a lot of other type of services I'm offering. Wow. Um, and we, we, were, we were just pulling in products and it got to the point where um, Gentox actually had some name recognition. Within a very, very short amount of time, people were starting to recognize the name. And um, we were actually getting people calling us and saying, hey, would you sell our product? Wow. Would you offer it? And I was kind of picking and choosing what I thought I could be able to sell and want it. And that's when it got nice is when I wasn't so much hounding people, hey, I want to sell your product, when they're actually calling me and saying, hey, would you sell my product? Wow. And so it, it turned out quite well. And actually, I was doing really, really well. And then um, the, the real success hit when, so at the time, it kind of backtrack a little bit, at the time, so my sales reps were, were actually getting some pretty good inroads with some major um, health organizations, hospital systems, um, major physician groups and stuff like that. So, I mean, we had some decent pull in the medical world yeah. and some decent connections, people ordering from us consistently. We had consistent services. Um, and so uh, we had some good, good name recognitions in the medical world. One, COVID hit. COVID hit, that's right. And it just kind of, it was a shoe in. I mean, we, we had attempted, because I knew, I knew Franco and he was an importer, I, I, would, I had attempted to import some, because every single time I'd walk into, into a doctor's office, I'm like, what could be really simple and easy to sell? And I started yeah. seeing stuff on the desk. I mean, there's some swabs, there's some gauze bandages, there's some band-aids. Uh, every time you go into a doctor's office, they have this big old roll of table that covered the exam table, yeah. exam table paper. Um, we would go into nursing homes. And, hey, how many adult diapers do you go through in a, in a month? Yeah. And so we, we, we started attempting to, to import some of those simpler stuff, and it was really hard to do that. Because you have big companies like uh, McKesson and Henry Schein and Medline that are just eight billion yeah. dollars a year billion on the Nasdaq, yeah. Nasdaq, and you're, you're like, well, how am I going to compete with them? Yes. Right? There's just no way I could compete with them, and we we really couldn't. I mean, um, every single time I tried to dive, because I knew there was money in that. And I was like, every time I tried to dive into that, we just couldn't hit the price points of these eight billion dollar year companies were doing, and so I dive in and end up getting out because it was we were losing money and. I'd go six, seven months and try at a different angle and see if I could find a different supplier for it and dive back into it. And it just wasn't working. Yeah. Um, but then COVID hit. And all of a sudden, the whole world dried up of PPE. And, and you're standing right there. I'm standing right in there. In the industry. In and the saying, industry. What the heck? I have the contacts. Everybody knows me. I have a pretty decent name for myself. 
And I just started spending, at that time I started spending, I was working about 18 hours a day because I would spend all day long training and managing representatives. And then every single night from about six o'clock at night to about two, three o'clock in the morning, I was on the phone with contacts in China wow. and developing more contacts and developing more people. And I had a guy that I pulled in that spoke Mandarin and he started translating for me. Wow. And it just, I just worked and worked and worked. And then I started selling my sales reps. Hey, you guys need to sell PPE. Just go out and start selling it. Yeah. Masks, gowns, gloves. And it's in demand. Now everybody is everybody dying for it. it. Everybody wants it. It's like, it's, it's short. I mean, right now we go through boxes and boxes even here. Yeah, yeah. Everybody wanted it. And so my company was doing decent, but then all of a sudden we started getting these massive, massive orders because even the big boys, McKesson, Hendershine, they, they started drying up with supplies. Um, and where I hit my big break was uh, the, the gowns, you know, the fabric to make the gowns, the factories that couldn't even get the fabric to make the gowns. Yeah. And, um, and I kind of noticed that the, 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 the gowns were kind of slowing down and I'm always a solution. I'm like, and I was going to these factories and said, well, why can't you sell me gowns? I'm like, we well, don't have any. I'm like, what do you mean you don't have any? And I'm like, how do I, how do I solve this? And so I can keep networking. I went and found the factory that actually made the fabric. Wow. Wow. And, and I think that's where the entrepreneur comes in, right? So all of a sudden, solutionist, solution, find the idea. Find the solution. That's find exactly the solution. It. Find the solution. Because yes, I have yes, orders. Yes. I got to find a solution. Find a solution. Yes. And I went to this factory and I bought a million yards of fabric. Wow. Just dumped everything I had into it. I'm like, this is the biggest risk. I just, I'm wow. just going to dump. I sent uh, a couple million dollars at the time down to China. Yeah. It's a ballsy move. Ballsy move. <laughs> ballsy move. Yeah. The more ballsy than most people realize. <laughs> But it wasn't two weeks later that the, the, the fabric market completely dried up. And guess who was sitting with all the fabric? Oh, you have it. I went to the factories. Uh, well, the problem we were having at the time was I'd go to these factories and I'd order these gowns and they'd, they'd make them. We'd be going over to pick them up. And they said, sorry, the Chinese government just can't pick it up. Or this government just can't pick it up. And you, you're not getting any gowns. And, and, the, and the factories couldn't do anything about it. So we're going we're to have to put you back in the end of the line again and remake them. And so I, I, the inventory I was paying for kept getting sold to somebody else. But this is your fabric now, right? No, at the time it wasn't. Okay. And that's why I solved the fabric got problem. It, it. So now I have the fabric, I go to the factory and guess what? You can't sell it to anybody else. And not only that, you can't sell it to anybody else, wow. but nobody else has it. Wow. And so I was selling gowns like it was going out of style. And I went from a couple million to over 20, 30 million dollars in sales overnight. Wow. Uh, overnight, and yeah. that's when you got involved. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> right. <laughs> that's when you got involved, and and I just started just just containers and containers yeah. of stuff, gowns, masks, everything, at just as fast as I could bring it in, it was going out the door. Wow. And starting in March of last year to um, December of last year, I mean, from March to December, we did eighty three million in sales. Wow, and that was your comeback. And that was my comeback. So uh, at that moment. When you finally made it and you say, well, this is it. Was there a point where you said, I can, do you take a breath at this po moment? Uh, I, where, where don't, does the I don't have that personality. I just can't stop. <laughs> I just can't stop. I, I mean, I, I was, I was sitting pretty. Um, so um, there's a drive inside you, right? It's drive. beyond money. It's a drive of it's, achievement. It's, it's achievement. It's because yeah. it, it, the money really wasn't really important. It was, yeah. it was comfort's always nice. And always, it's we're going back and say, I, I, I accomplished that. I, I set a goal and I hit it. I, I think that there's a, a misconception where people see CEOs and entrepreneurs and they think that there's a drive just for the money. Like money is a byproduct of what we do. It's a byproduct. But it's like no one realizes that there is something much bigger of trying to achieve something. And we're really trying to go for goals. And I know because I feel when yeah. we talk, I can feel it from you. Yeah. Obviously, I, I believe you feel it from me. It's the goal. It's the goal of what we're trying to get. Yeah, last time we talked, I totally, I mean, your story is similar. Yes. It's similar. And... <laughs> The, the way you and I hit it off, I mean, he's, he's, he's like minds because it, yes. it's the goal. It's I want to set something that's hard. Yes. And I want to get there. Yes. I don't care that's right. how much money I do make or I don't make. I just want to get there. So do it. I want to do it. I want to do it right. And I want to do it the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just want to get there. It, it, it's true. And I, I think that's what people see me like. They don't understand that. And a lot of people say, hey, I want to make this. And I want to buy this. And I want to have a Ferrari. And I want to have this. And there's not, I have a very simple life. My life is very simple. Yeah. But it's like, it was what this place is and for you it's that achievement and i think that it's such it's such an important thing for us uh, i think it's amazing i think that it wasn't about the house the cars or the how no, much it your paycheck it no, wasn't not i mean i was living in a mediocre house i mean it was 
2,500, 3,000 square feet. It was small and it was a rental and it was beat up and, 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 but I had no credit. I couldn't get anything. I couldn't. Can't even apply for a job. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't apply for a hundred couldn't, million. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I couldn't apply for a job, couldn't get a job. Uh, and no one would hire me because they couldn't pass a background check. Uh, if it wasn't for my sales reps, there's no way I could have done any of those sales because yeah. uh, right. if they would have looked at me and, pat and did a background check on me, there wouldn't, and most of my orders are from major state agencies and, and major hospital systems. And if they would have looked up Uriah Kennedy, or, there's no way I would have gotten any of those sales. It was a fact that I was hiring and training good people. Yes. And I had good staff behind me and good people behind me that were out there doing it. And I just, I, I was a big picture guy. I'm just, right. and you just have to be honest and you have to be hardworking. And so when you hit your achievement and now you feel there's a point where you say, okay, yeah, I, I've done it. Do you set yourself a next goal now? I did set myself the next goal and he was it. <laughs> that goal was set back in 2012. 2012, so you still yeah, had you it said, in your sights, yeah, huh? No matter what, I'm going to buy this guy's company, yeah. no matter what. I so before I was in prison, I, mean, I, I wanted his company because he, he had this um, uh, distribution company to Walmart and other big box retailers. Yeah. And I'm like, I could make that so big. It's so such an easy concept to import, sell it to a big boxer, just and just... Volume. I was thinking big numbers. I mean, uh, I could take an, an item that costs two dollars, but if I could sell a million of them, that's a lot of money, that's right? A lot of money. That's right. A lot of money. It, it's a it's a it's a numbers game. It's a numbers game. Yeah. And uh, I tried buying it back then. Uh, the, the financing fell through. I didn't have anything. This time, with this much money behind me, I just walked up to Frank and said, "I want your company," and he when said, "And I wrote a check for it." I said, "I want your company. I want your laptop." <laughs> Hit the road. <laughs> <That's right>. no, <laughs> just take your toothbrush. With just you. take your toothbrush. <laughs> no, no bank, no nothing. I nothing. just walked up from the check. Wow. And bought it. That's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> so, so now, going through all this, how often do you reminisce about where you were? Do you do you still Every, think all the time? I mean, my wife is just awestruck. She's just like, we had nothing. We we couldn't even put gas in the car. I mean, we were going through the couches and. She would, she'd come home crying because uh, we were living off of a meager teacher salary. Yeah. And you, uh, you know how much teachers make. Yeah, they don't make <laughs> much. Nothing. They don't make much. She, she, was, she was teaching kindergarten and first grade at the time, and they were, they were even less than the upper grades. Um, so, yeah, we were making nothing at the time. And to where, I mean, I, I went and bought my house in cash. I bought my cars in cash. I don't owe, I don't have any debt. I have comfortable. I bought his company in cash. I bought everything. So... So you've taken over his company now. Where do you feel you're going? So you're going to expand his company? It's, it's expanding. I mean, uh, his company was doing probably about $3 million a year on average. Um, I've owned it for almost a year now. And probably just more like seven months. Seven, right? eight seven months. Because you bought it in October. So. In October, okay. yeah. So seven, eight months, and <laughs> we've already done $6 million in sales just oh. in the last six months. So. So after this, so after the company's done, wh where's your plan? You're going to take this bigger? You have something else in your site? Well, I, uh, I want to know where the long goal is. I can meet the, you the down there. <laughs> oh, he's already oh. told me what his long goal is. <laughs> long goal is, is uh, I'm, I'm Gen Talks are still up and running yes. and, and, uh, and doing quite well. But the long goal is, is I want to take him from doing um, $3 million a year to doing 100 million. 100 million. I want to be doing about a million dollars a day. Wow. What I want to be doing. Wow. And in fact, yeah, just not to interrupt, but one of his salesmen, uh, salesperson, like about two or three weeks ago, did a million dollars in two days. Wow. It's in sales. Did about 750 on one day in sales, walking into a Walmart and getting the order, going back the next day to one wow. of the larger managers and doing another 250 or 300,000. So in a single, in two days, he did a million dollars. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That is amazing. <coughs> That's a, an amazing story from start to finish. Actually, I didn't realize some of that stuff in between, which we, we'd never really decided. I know, I, knew no, I don't share it with people, but I thought, oh, this is an opportunity. <laughs> that. I think it's I, I'm, I'm hoping that in your podcast here that there are people that, are, that yes. are down there, are down there. And I mean, you, you got to give hope to people and say, look, it's just work ethic. It's, it's not getting down. It's not getting depressed. It's not going to alcohol. It's not going to drugs. It's not... Uh, Finding alternatives to cope is yes. set a goal and get to it. Set your goal, go for it, focus, keep going, 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 bad through weather, wind, rain, shine, go, 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 and don't stop until don't you get stop. it. Don't stop. Wow. It's, all, it's all here. It's all there. Um, and if you don't know what you're doing, that's why we have the internet. For that's I mean, exactly right. I, I didn't go to school. I didn't go sign up for a college degree. I didn't go to some classes. I, 
I opened up my laptop, I opened up my cell phone, and I, I just read, and mm -hmm. I read, and I read, and I studied. And, wow. and, and keeping it in that as much is, is when I started doing all that PPE last year, I knew nothing about logistics. I didn't know who Matson was or Costco or any of these major shipping lines. I didn't APL, know APL, EXX. It, 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 <laughs> all the terminology yeah, you know it. like by the yeah. back of your hand, right? Yeah. We, we. I knew nothing. And so I, the same thing I did with medical, I had to do real fast. Yeah. Wow. And I sat down and I studied and I learned and I memorized. Like, okay, okay, what, what is dray edge? What is, what is weights and measure dimensions and weather measurements? Or yeah. well, what's the container cost? Or how are these shippers contained? How do they move? Um, yes. What's trucking? How do I schedule trucking and it's, it, it's, it's funny it's when we talk because now with the entrepreneurship entrepreneur inside you talking to logistics companies, you know that you say, Hey, there's a better way for you to do it because we're o always over analyzing uh, other people's businesses. Correct. And I think that's a problem that I have too. So when I work with business, say, Oh, if I was you, I would do it like this. this. And I would do this. And why are you not doing this? And who's this guy over there? And you try to over analyze. And it's funny because I've, I've seen the way yeah. that you try, Oh, he should do it like this. And we should do it like <laughs> this. This is common sense. And it's, it's really a bad habit that we have as entrepreneurs because we over, always over analyze. It's a constant problem solving. Yes. That's right. I, I see it. I see something. I just want to make it better. I see something. I see a problem. I want to fix it. Yes. And it, you're just you, you. So you go to bed at night, right? That's right. You go to bed. That's what you think. You get up in the morning. Like, how, how do I solve this? How is that solution coming from? Right. <laughs> <laughs> how do you solve this? And I had to learn it, it just as much studying as I put into medical. I had to learn your industry. Yes. Because I knew nothing about it. And, but I had eighty million dollars worth of product. All of a sudden, had to be here, on time. State yes. agencies, hospitals were demanding it on time and and moving by rail, going across country, and understanding that too. And it's hard to move two or three containers. Yes, I was moving two hundred. Yes, and I had. And I saw the volume. <laughs> you saw the volume because I went through your warehouse. Yes. and you saw the volume, and I had to move two hundred, and without a mistake. Yes, without a mistake. Yeah, because you're being and judged. Because you're being judged, and and it's too easy for these people to cancel contract, cancel PO, and you're you're out. You're out yeah. that money and. You're playing a big it, field now. Now you have field. to be the big guy in the big field. Big field, because I mean, uh, a, a loss isn't. No, oh, I lost a couple thousand dollars. No, losses. I just lost two million dollars or three yes. million dollars. Yes. <laughs> it could bankrupt you real fast. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot of because you're making again back to the, the the volume. You're making twenty cents here, thirty cents there on an item. It takes a lot of items to sell to make up for a yeah. five hundred thousand or million dollar loss. It's with, with everything that you experienced and the knowledge you've taken from this, as bad as it was, would you have changed the path that you have taken to get here? Um, I know that bad things happen with trusting people, but with your experience of prison and getting out and I would have changed some of the things back in my construction company on how I manage stuff. Um, I, I, I was never a really a micromanager. Um, I was trying to, f I was more of a trust people, make trust assignments people. and- Could we assume people would make the same decisions as you, but the brain thinks a little different when you're yeah. very entrepreneurial. So I, 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 running this company now, and the reason I'm so successful running these companies is I learned a lot from running my construction company. And there's a lot of things I changed on how I manage that to how I manage things now. Yeah. I still don't micromanage, but I, I'm a trust and verify. I'm a uh, making sure I, I, I poke in, I measure things. I, I don't let any ball drop. And so yes. I handle all balls. So I'm in with the shipping department because now I'm, I'm sitting at about 150 employees. Wow. So I, I, I got about 70 or 80 uh, sales reps and then I've got about 20, 25 employees in my warehouse back in Salt Lake. Plus I'm using your warehouses here. Yeah. So we're, we're managing a lot. So I'm always checking in with the shipping department. I'm always checking in with my graphic design team. And I'm, I'm always checking with my accounts okay. payable and accounts receivable. Then I'm out in the warehouse. Yes. just checking out with my warehouse guys, making sure the warehouse is stacked right, they're not taking too many steps, they know where everything's at, it's organized, yep. they're not wasting time out yep. there trying to p pick and pull. I mean, there's, there's a lot of aspects. And so you're, you're trusting, you're signing, but um, there's, a, there's definitely a large learning curve of how I used to manage things to how I manage things now. So what do you do in your downtime? How do you put your brain to sleep well, now I've, 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 I've got money, so. <laughs> <laughs> you don't pay people to carry you then, right? Yeah, I, I see, yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I mean my, my kids, I mean, my kids are probably the biggest thing because um, I've had these detailed conversations with them, and I, I've sat down with them. I says, okay, we've got money. We've had money because they were the rich kids on the block back when I was home building to dirt poor to being the rich kids on the block again. And I'm like, you know where we came through. Yes. Don't ever take that for granted. 
don't ever. You see how hard I work and how far in the dumps we work. Yeah. Don't ever take advantage of that. Don't mock anybody. Don't, and That's right. and they, they, they've learned a lot of respect, and they've learned a lot of respect for money now. And so even though when um, we go out in the snowmobiles all winter now, I mean, I love snowmobiling, and I'm out in the four-wheelers all summer. I, I've got a big RV, and we, we went touring just a couple weeks ago for spring break and went to a lot of national parks and had a lot of fun. And and um, so it, it, the money is really not an obstacle anymore. It's, it's well, let's go do this. Let's have, go have some fun. And so we, we are able to find that, that time because I've got good people around me now. But I just um, want to come to stroke your horses when, I, when I'm down there. I just want to pet them. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a lot of fun. Um, but it, y- you... The one thing that I emphasize to my kids is you know where you came from. Yes. You stay humble Yes, because okay. we've been there. It's very easy to have the and ego it's very it. easy to get back there. Yeah. I mean, who, who knew that the 2008 market was going to crash like it did and we were going to go from having the world to having nothing? I, I think that also with social media and, you know, it's very easy for people to fall into the or kids to fall into social media because you know, everyone's watching YouTube yeah. nowadays or Instagram or Twitter and they're seeing people look like they have fantasies. Like with me and my kids, I have to explain to them it's not real. Like it's not real. Or it's people just taking pictures to be something that they're not. Yeah. And I think it's very an important part of uh, upbringing. And I, I can relate to what you're saying about keeping your kids humble. Yeah. And my, my oldest son uh, joined the army. Oh. In Served us, served in Korea, served in for, for a while. And my second son's in the Air Force. My other two sons are um, junior ROTC cadets in the Air Force. And so, and the one thing that I can see in them is massive amounts of work ethic. And um, as little kids, I mean, they didn't really always have it. But as they've seen my rise and fall, and I don't really pay a lot of people come over and do stuff for me. I, I force them out. So if there's a project in the yard, there's a something needs to be fixed around the house or um, we need to go build something, yeah. repair something. I mean, That's I was right. a contractor. I know how to do yeah. this stuff and I actually enjoy it, but it's, I make them go out and do that kind of stuff. I make them work. And I'm like, this is going to save your life because if yeah. you don't know how to work, That's you'll right. never get anywhere. Yeah. I want to thank you for your time and thank you for coming out. And it has been extremely inspirational I mean, the story, I didn't know how deep it went. I knew it went deep. deep. I know we, we, were ha- we had a good conversation, but now I didn't realize it went deeper than what I imagined. Yeah. But it's extremely inspirational. And I, I hope that somebody listening to this sees that of what you're trying to bring and what I want them to see. I think it's amazing. I want to thank you very much for both of you I, coming I'm out. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I'm glad. Get it, I be serving scoops, ayy I'm on my loops, ayy If you're watching Swiss Beatbox, just hit the replay I be serving scoops, ayy I'm on my tunes, ayy If I'm just tripping on this beat What the fuck about a fleet, ayy By the way, I still do this for the show <laughs>